Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are so honored to be joined by Kimberly Mayor Don McCormick. Nestled in the heart of the Kootenai Rocky region of British Columbia, the city of Kimberly exudes charm and natural beauty. Known as the Bavarian City of the Rockies, its downtown area boasts picturesque alpine architecture, boutique shops, and cozy cafes, offering a unique blend of Canadian and European ambiance. Visitors can explore the extensive network of hiking and biking trails in the summer, while winter brings world-class skiing and snowboarding opportunities at the nearby Kimberly Alpine Resort. Now, beyond its natural wonders, Kimberly also embraces its rich mining history. With attractions like the Underground Mining Railway and the Kimberly Heritage Museum providing fantastic insights into the city's past. With its friendly community, stunning landscapes, and diverse recreational offerings, Kimberly truly embodies the essence of mountain living in British Columbia. So stay tuned as we'll be right back with Cross Border Interviews featuring Mayor Don McCormick. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Don, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the mayor's persona. And I got to ask the question I've asked every single municipal leader who's ever come on the show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. So um, my wife and I moved here from Sherwood Park, Alberta, uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we were escaping the winter. Uh, for the most part, we love snow. We just didn't like the 30 belows that tended to, uh, you know, stay for the duration of the winter in, in Edmonton. Uh, in any event, we we moved out here. And um, what we discovered very quickly was that when you're in a small community, uh, you need to get involved. Um, and uh, we embraced that fairly quickly. Uh, both of us did. Uh, the first thing I did was join the Rotary Club. Um, I got involved in... Uh, a number of boards, the Community Futures East Kootenai Board, for example. Um, I was one of the founding directors of the Tourism Kim Kimberley Board back in 2007. I was president of the Chamber of Commerce for a couple of years. So I immersed myself in the community and those things that were having an impact on the community. And um, uh, really enjoyed uh, all of that and got to know who was doing what to who and what the communities were all about, both Kimberly and Cranbrook. Uh, we're only 30 kilometers away, so it's kind of like a super community. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of how it all started. Uh, community service, because it's a small community and they need people to step up. Had you ever had an interest in municipal politics prior to running in 2011? Or are you like every other municipal politician I speak to and say, until someone asked me, it wasn't really on my radar? None whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, in fact, the furthest possible thing from my mind. Um, the reason I got involved in 2011, and I made the decision relatively close to the election, well, within six months of the election, um, I, had a, I had a real chat with my wife, and we were not happy with how slowly things were transitioning in Kimberley. Uh, the, the Sullivan Mine, which was the reason for our existence, closed in 2001. Uh, it was 10 years on, and quite frankly, the community was still in denial that the mine had in fact closed and there wasn't going to be some other 
entity that was going to look after us the way uh, Kaminko did back in the day. And so, um, you know, economic development in its broadest sense was what, you know, my my interest was. And I wanted to jumpstart some things and felt the only way I could do that was to uh, run for council. So I did in 2011 and managed to uh, make it on my first try. I'm going to ask a very stupid question. And we're only three questions into this interview, but I feel like you're up for it. How does a guy from Sherwood Park move to Kimberley, British Columbia, and become a proponent for a mining industry that has closed down 10 years after he got there? <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, I think that's a statement, Chris. <laughs> well, statement, to okay, so the, then the question then becomes, what was it about the municipal draw? Because you you get on council 10 years after that mine closes, and it is an economic sort of powerhouse and it gets picked up left closed and now you have to be there left picking up all the pieces what was it about 2011 that you finally said okay i need to do this we need some more economic development and we need to move the city forward in not just a way that's going to be thinking about the past but thinking about the future well uh quite frankly our trajectory was down if you were looking at things on a graph, it would be pointing down. And uh, I didn't see um, any real leadership at that time that was going to change the equation. Uh, the focus was almost entirely on tourism. And we were at one of 14 resort municipalities in uh, British Columbia. And uh, we have an incredible tourism product. But uh, no matter how many visitors we have come to town, the impact of that disposable income is on the business community and, and you know retail and kind of all of the services that are happening around town. It does not generate a single dollar for the municipality. We get our money from taxes and specifically taxes on buildings. So unless you have an awful lot of building going on, um, the, uh, the amount of revenue coming into the city is, is pretty marginal. Uh, so uh, at that point in time, we were at a what I would call a low watermark. And uh, businesses were closing in town. Um, almost everything was for sale. Uh, it was, um, I mean, the kindest way I could put it was to say we were tired and um, everything that goes with being tired. And so uh, I really felt there needed to be a catalyst, um, you know, to come in and, and start facilitating change. So you spent three years on council, three to four years on council as a councillor. Then in 2014, you run for mayor, you're elected, you're reelected in 2018, and you're acclaimed in 2022. With the statement you just said about the catalyst, about the decline, now you are almost, I want to say, 15 years into your tenure yeah. as a municipal politician. Yeah. Have you seen a turnaround? Is Kimberly the same city that you moved to when you moved to the community so long ago? Oh, definitely not. Um, you know, we we are in a uh, uh, in a really really good position right now. The difficulty is um, that when you when you transition and when there is a visible transition into a better place, there is a propensity to um, not want change anymore. Uh, so back in 2011, everybody wanted change. Everybody could look around and say, wow, you know, we need to do something. Now that we're sitting here 10 years later, um, you know, in a much better place, we're getting exactly the opposite, especially with newer people moving to town. And we've had we've had a, you know, a growth of about one and a half percent per year for the last 15 years. Nice steady, manageable growth. Uh, but uh, most of the new people coming to town um, are um, either semi-retirees or retirees or folks that are moving here from Calgary, you know, other parts of British Columbia, Ontario, quite frankly, all parts of Canada, most of them are moving here with money. And so they don't really want to see an awful lot of change because they're moving here because of what we are today. And that presents um, a completely different problem for us as a municipality in trying to plan our way forward. And uh, quite honestly, this is a much more difficult problem than the other one where people want change and they're behind you in making things happen. 
So how do you balance that aspect? Because I, I I assume that over the time in office, you have come to the realization, like every other municipal leader, even one year into time, you're not going to please 100% of the people with any decision you make. I don't care what decision it is. There's always going to be some people out there who say, it's I don't want it. It's too much change. I like Kimberly the way it is. How do you balance sort of the wants and needs of the community with the foresight that as a council and as a mayor, you have to put into place to ensure that you grow in a sustainable way, but not do it in a fashion that could potentially say to people, okay, it's changed too much. I want to move down the road to Fernie now. Right. So uh, so I guess the, the easiest way to answer that, um, and I know this may sound overly simplistic, but decisions that are made need to be in the best interest of the entire community. Uh, even those parts of the community that don't see it as uh, a direction or a decision that needs to happen. But if we as a council agree that this is in the best interest of the entire community, then we make the call and, and we move forward. And interestingly, once that's made, once the call is made, a lot of the opposition goes away. Uh, you only see opposition leading up to a decision. And then once the decision is made, uh, you know, it's business as usual. How do you ensure that you're getting it right, though? As the mayor of your community, you you go out, I'm assuming you talk to people on a regular basis, and you, though, at the end of the day, have that one vote. You are the one vote that makes the decision. You, are, you and your council are part of a team that makes the decision to move the city forward. How do you, how do you and I'm speaking to you right now, ensure that you get it right and make the decisions in the best interest of the entire community? Well, from a personal point of view, I, I spend most of my time out in the community. And uh, so I think I've got a pretty good pulse on all of the various aspects of the community. What's important here, though, is that um, I don't get to make that call. Uh, I can provide some leadership. I can provide ideas. I can provide um, a lot of... Um, motivation in moving in a particular direction, but A, uh, council is there, um, six other people with one vote each as well. Uh, we, we all, or at least four of us need to be convinced, but we also have staff. We have professional staff, experienced staff, whose job it is, is to take the ideas and the things that I and council bring forward and vet all of that and provide staff reports with, in, with analysis that allows us to make an informed decision. And uh, we don't always decide the way staff have laid things out or what their recommendation is. Uh, the majority of the time, for sure, the vast majority, but not always, uh, because there are, um, in addition to pragmatic, there are also political aspects to the decisions that are being made. And uh, as a council, we weigh uh, both of those. Are the people of Kimberley engaged with their city council? Do you, would you say, uh, because I speak to municipal leaders across this country and I, I hear some say that, oh, I have a great community, that there's no apathy when it comes to issues that are in front of City Hall. And then I hear the complete reverse and say, I'd be hard pressed if I go downtown my community tomorrow and talk to 10 people, they would know what's on the agenda or what's going on in my community. Is there an apathy about what's going on in City Hall until, like you said, a controversial decision is made or... Are you like the average resident who says, as long as my water's turned on in the morning and my garbage is picked up on garbage day, I'm a happy <laughs> at go lucky person. So, um, so I think that the majority of people in any municipality are that way. Uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they're not informed. Um, what I find is that um, in kind of my out and about in the community, people are pretty well informed about things that are going on. They just don't speak up. They don't engage. The one that drives me crazy is the financial plan. You know, we, uh, at the end of it, we have, uh, at the end of the process, we we have the meeting that is where council is going to be make, making the decision on what the increase in the tax rate's going to be, how we're gonna pay for the things, the priorities that we have. And if we have 10 people show up for that meeting, it's a big number. And it's been that way the entire time that I have been on council. Um, post COVID, it's a little better because people can uh, you know, tune in uh, through our YouTube channel. Uh, but even those numbers are measured in a couple of hundred. And we have in excess of 
6,500, somewhere between 6,000 and 6,500 uh, electorate, uh, people over the age of 18. So um, it's, it's just, that one drives me crazy because a lot of people complain about their tax rates. And yet when it comes time to provide that opinion and we're making the decision, they're nowhere to be found. However, what I've come to understand is that there is an inherent trust that residents have in who they have elected. And they get an opportunity every four years to weigh in on that. They either liked it or they didn't. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious, um, you know, kind of whether you're doing a good job or not when the election comes around. When, as someone who's been acclaimed, I can imagine that gives you a big boost <laughs> in knowing that you're doing something right. Uh, uh, well, so yes and no. Um, I mean, for sure, it, it was an indicator you know, that people were reasonably happy. But it's also an indicator that nobody wanted to run, you know, against me, um, which, you know, I think is um, uh, important to recognize. If somebody had run against me, you know, um, who knows what the outcome of that might have been. So I don't get, you know, I being acclaimed, I wasn't all that proud of being acclaimed, quite frankly, Chris. And uh, the other thing about acclamation is you do not, as especially as a mayor, uh, you don't get to engage the community and what your priorities and what your vision is for the next four years. Um, Can I challenge I, you on that for a second? Can I absolutely. challenge you there for, because don't you though, because while you are acclaimed, you, you, you still get to go out and tell people what your plans are for the next four years. Uh, but you're just not running against anyone. Are you saying right here, right now, that in 2022, when you were acclaimed, you didn't engage with residents or you did, but you just didn't get to do it in the fashion like in 2018 and then 2014? Exactly. Yeah. No, okay. It was not it wasn't in a formal way. It was it was much more informal yeah. and it didn't uh, blanket the community. Uh, when you're in an election campaign, it blankets the community. Uh, you have an engine, you know, in behind you. You have your your campaign, and uh, it's a way to blanket the community with with your message. Uh, when you're acclaimed, it's it's a little bit different. And there's also, um, you know, a, an element of not wanting to get in the way of the election that's actually happening with the X number of people that are running for council. So um, it's it's not. It's not exactly simple, uh, the answer to that. But uh, in all honesty, acclamation, I do not think is a good thing for the community. I don't think it's good for democracy either, but that's just Chris Brown, the host of the show, saying that. <laughs> yeah. But that's just that's just my own personal opinion. I want to ask one last question before we turn to the city as a whole, because I'm cautious of time, and I've got to get this out on the table, because I'm slowly working my way through BC, and I want to learn more about the jurisdictional roles that the municipality plays and the understanding of the jurisdictional roles that residents have in your community. When people do approach you, are they approaching you on municipal issues or are they approaching you on healthcare issues, education issues, issues that are provincial or even federal jurisdictional issues? Because you know that you have a role as the municipality to play. You can't get into the weeds of what's going on in Victoria. You can't get into the weeds of how to direct funding to a hospital or a school. But I can imagine people have asked you those questions. Do people understand the role that the municipality plays in their day-to-day -day life in Kimberley? Um, so from a, uh, from a purely academic point of view, I think the answer is yes to that. From a practical point of view, their residents and things like healthcare, education, housing, these three in particular, probably have the most significant impact on our residents and yet are completely outside the jurisdiction of the municipality. So uh, it makes it extremely difficult for us as, as municipal um, elected officials to be able to um, you know, tiptoe through that minefield, <laughs> so to speak. Um, I will say though that uh, particularly as the mayor, um, I have a significant advocacy role to play on the part of my community to all of those jurisdictions, in particular, the provincial government. Uh, that's, you know, in part because of the impact those things have on the community, but also because um, we rely, uh, well, I guess there's a couple of things with regard to the province. Uh, we need to ensure that we don't allow too much downloading to happen and assume responsibility 
because I'll tell you, the province is happy to let you assume responsibility if you're going to do that. Um, and there is a there is a really fine line there between the advocacy part of it and uh, not getting into the weeds, as uh, as you've said. Um, the it, other has it has it gotten worse post pandemic because the pandemic kind of changed the name of the game of what responsibility because you as the local elected leader are in your community 24 seven, seven days a week, 365 days. Yes. You go away for vacations and all that, but you are the closest to the people and you deal with them on probably on a day-to-day -day basis compared to your MLA or MP post pandemic. People are now looking at the municipalities to offer more services because during the pandemic, you offered more services and you were the ones yeah. closest to the people. Have you yeah. seen a dynamic shift between what people's uh, reasonable wants were pre-pandemic to post-pandemic? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and this may sound a little counterintuitive, but I think it's gotten easier or better post-pandemic. And uh, not not better in the strict sense of jurisdictional uh, lines, but uh, the money that is flowing post pandemic into the municipalities is unheard of. And with that money comes us uh, where we're, we now have an affordability on things that impact our residents that we did not have pre pandemic. And uh, uh, I have been just mind it's been mind boggling. Um, the province of BC uh, distributed, I think it was a billion dollars to the 160 some odd municipalities on, I don't know if it was a per capita basis, whatever the formula was. Kimberly, we're 8,200 8, people. Uh, Kimberly got $3.4 million. Uh, that is a huge amount of money. And the significance of it is there were no strings attached. They actually sent us a check. They didn't say, how would you like to spend $3.4 million or what are your priorities on where this money should be allocated? It's here's a check and uh, we'll follow up with some rules. But at the end of the day, it's really up to us on how we are to distribute that money. And uh, it's mostly infrastructure related things that we're spending the money on, uh, obviously, or, mo you know, Quite obviously, I guess. Uh, but at the end of the day, I referred to this as money for nothing. Um, and I didn't mean that to sound glib uh, in any way. It's It was just mind boggling. And that's only one example. Um, Kimberly um, is in the process of replacing its wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it's the single largest pro uh, project in the history of the city. Uh, it's a $90 million replacement for this plant. Um, we were unsure as to whether or not we were going to get uh, grant funding to be able to make this happen. Uh, it took seven years, six years actually, of planning and kind of moving forward. But uh, about a couple of months ago, or just before Christmas, uh, it was announced that between the feds and the province, they pony up, ponied up $66 million as a grant to help us get this in place. Now, for a community of 8,000 people, man, that, that, that kind of money is, it's life-changing. <laughs> it truly is. And so uh, just a couple of examples of, uh, you know, the, uh, the money that has been flowing and it has, uh, it has helped considerably in, uh, in the work that we need to do locally with residents. I was just reading a newspaper article because I tried to do some research on the community before we talk about the issues. I tried to learn a little bit about the community before I talk. And I was reading about that wastewater facility. And uh, and I, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but your, uh, one of your staff members is actually going to be the project lead on the, uh, on the project. And that is a significant thing, especially for a small community, because traditionally larger urban centers get uh, have that happen, where now Kimberly is taking the role and responsibility of being the project lead on a massive project like that uh, pro a program that you just mentioned. So good yeah. job. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, the individual involved has been, um, uh, basically he has, he has moved out of his existing project management position and is dedicated to this for the next four years. And um, uh, we believe that that's the only way we can control the success or the outcome of the, uh, of the project. 
So I want to turn to my second segment now because uh, I want to ask the million dollar question in this one because I think it's important. And before I do that, I want to preface this as I always do on the show, that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. He is one of seven votes on council. He cannot pass anything by himself unless I was speaking to someone in Ontario in his position. I, he would be able to. But in the See, in the city of Kimberley, he is one of seven votes. So, Mayor, with that being said, in your opinion, as of recording this episode in 2024, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Kimberley today? Well, uh, the single biggest. Um, there are or two, and, and there are two, and they're connected. Uh, the first has to do with the um, uh, with the pace at which we are uh, able to do infrastructure renewal. Um, as an example, in Kimberley, um, we got. Uh, let me take a step back. In 2015, the province mandated that a community must have an asset management plan in place in order to get grant money for anything. Uh, we jumped on that right away. And in 2016, we got an asset management assessment put in place on kind of where all of our asset classes were. And um, we it was it was eye opening. Uh, in fact, it was a little bit scary. Um, the uh, the best asset class we had was roads. I'm not sure how many communities where their best asset class is roads, but and this is on the basis of, of depreciation, right? Amortization. So uh, roads, and we only had 40% useful life left in those roads of all of our roads in the city. So to give you an idea of just generally speaking where the infrastructure uh, piece was at, it was our best at 40% of useful life. Uh, the worst was our fleet. And that's not just vehicles, that's graders. It, it's it's kind of all of the tools that staff need to be able to get things done, like snow clearing, for example. It was sitting at 15%. So we had we had city workers out there trying to do a job, um, in my opinion, without the tools to actually get that job done. So um it was it was um I mean, I can't imagine why asset plans weren't required previously. But boy, it was a real wake-up call. So what the um, the investment we were needing to make in order to make up that $73 million deficit that we had at that point in time was uh, an average of about 12 to $15 million a year in new capital spending. And um, up to that point in time, there were years where we'd spent $2,000, you know, $4,000. And our ongoing amortization is four million, sorry, not $4,000 million. Our ongoing amortization is four is four million dollars a year. So just to tread water, we have to be spending four million a year in capital expenditures. So uh, we're now up to about ten uh, is about what we're doing, which is a huge improvement. But the fact is that the plan calls for right now, as of last year, with inflation and everything, about fifteen million a year. Um, the fact is that it took us about fifty years or more to dig that hole no way we're going to dig out of it in 20 years. So I think that the expectations for how quickly we're going to be able to manage this have been a little out of sync. What we have done, though, with that management plan is used it to prioritize those areas where we spend the money. And um, it's uh, it's worked out really well. I think we've got a pretty good handle on what's going on and uh, more to come. Expectation versus reality are two different things, though, because you, the expectation of what you can do is only predicated by the fact of the reality of how much money you have. And municipalities cannot run deficits. And I'm assuming the province is not sending you a $300 million or $3 million check every other week, like no. a paycheck. They are only sending that once in a blue moon. You, yeah, so you, go ahead. Yeah, so that transitions into the second thing, uh, which is tied to it, and that's diversification of the tax base. Uh, when the mine closed, we went from a 50-50 residential, industrial, commercial to 87% um, residential. So 87% of the taxes that we pay in Kimberley are on the backs of our residences. And in most communities, you're looking at anywhere from maybe 50 to 65%. And so... Um, that, that diversification of the tax base is absolutely critical to being able to invest more money in that infrastructure renewal. 
uh, so that it doesn't come out of, so that our taxes don't get unaffordable. Things are going up. Things are costing more to do day-to-day uh, -day work in, in today's age. And I can imagine that the municipalities are feeling this as well as everyone else in the world. For sure. Are, are you finding, because I know you're going through your budget process right now, because I, if I'm not mistaken, you do not have to have it ready for like tomorrow or the next week. You have some May. time, be May, before you have to actually have it released. Um this year is a little tough on a lot of municipalities. You're, you're just talking about the asset management and planning for the future and prioritizing things. You were talking about diversifying the economy. Is this year tough for you guys uh, if financially? Because I know I, I read an interview with yourself talking about there isn't going to be any big surprises in this year's budget, but I can imagine there are some things that are pretty hard to talk about around that table, particularly when it comes to growing your economy and growing your community at the same time. So, uh, so I think um, it, it has been uh, better than what you might expect. And part of that reason is because we jumped on that asset management issue so early. Uh, I'm looking around the province at a number of municipalities that are looking at double digit tax increases, not just this year, but probably next year and the year after as well, uh, as part of their five year financial plan. And a lot of it has to do with uh, building infrastructure reserves. And uh, the one thing that we did, again, in conjunction with getting the plan together, was started to bolster our reserves. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, in 2015, when I was first elected, we had um, um, we had something in, in the area of four or five million dollars in reserves. And uh, this past year, we're sitting all inclusive at sitting at about 25 million. So the 25 million is still not good enough, uh, quite frankly, but it is much better than what it was. And uh, we were feeling really good a couple of years ago until this whole inflation thing started to hit. And it really has eaten into the reserves. And we're in a position now where uh, our financial folks are, are, you know, they've got a pretty tight handle on the purse strings. So while the decisions that are being made on projects and things like that, you know, some things are being deferred. At the end of the day, we're getting all of the important things done. And, um, you know, this cycle for our budget has probably been easier than it has been in the in the past five years. At the beginning of this interview, you talked about the better need of the community and looking at the community as a whole. Now, if I go talk to 100 people in Kimberley, they're not going to say some macro issues like infrastructure, asset management. They're going to talk about some very micro issues. That pothole yeah. in front of my house, that park, that service level needs to be upgraded. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the one? And yes, I'm quoting Star Trek here and Spock from Wrath of Khan, but I've got to ask because you can't do everything that you want and not re remember the people who have put you in that position because the most important thing to them is that issue, that pothole, that park that needs upgrade, yeah. that playground that needs to be changed. How do you balance the needs of the individual when it comes to financial issues with the needs of the community? Well, with respect to those operational issues, um, you know, we've got uh, systems in place, uh, including, uh, you know, points of contact and communication that allows uh, residents to take what whatever their particular issue is and get it in the queue, so to speak. And then it's really up to our operations managers to be able to triage that, not dissimilar to an ER. And um, uh, it behooves us as elected officials to stay out of the way. And uh, we endeavor to do that. It's difficult, uh, but uh, it's important uh, to do it that way. I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to sort of the flip question that I originally asked, because I've been accused on this show of only talking about negative things when it comes to community. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you the flip to the issues. What does Kimberly do right what is the thing that when you go to UBCM, when you go talk to municipal leaders from across BC and around Canada, what's the thing you boast about the most from a governance perspective or an administration perspective? Wow, that's um, that's a really tough question, Chris. Um, <laughs> I always found that weird that people think that was the tough question, not the issues. Issues are fine. <laughs> what we do right you can, I, top. <laughs> but you can you can put your finger on an issue it's very difficult to put your finger on 
how you feel. And at the end of the day, it's really about the general well-being and how the community feels about itself. Uh, it's very intangible. And, um, you know, I, I've heard terms like um, vibe, uh, you know, or momentum, you know, some of these terms to try and describe it. And um, it, it's just really hard to put your finger on when you're talking about intangibles. And I think the one thing Kimberly is recognized for is that collection of intangibles that just feels good, either when you visit the community or for those residents that live here. I don't know that there is a, you know, is a single, a single thing. Um, the lifestyle that we have here, I hesitate to use that word lifestyle. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty overused in a lot of contexts these days, but, you know, our community is really about an outdoor lifestyle. Um, we've got uh, in excess of 200 kilometers of trails, uh, including um, I think the eighth or ninth largest municipal park in the country, uh, the Kimberly Nature Park is about twice the size of Stanley Park in Vancouver, for example, all full of walking trails, hiking trails, uh, you know, biking. Um, you know, we've got three golf courses in town uh, within the municipal limits. Uh, we have an alpine ski hill uh, that's pretty sizable. We got about 80 runs up at the Kimberly Alpine Resort, uh, which is uh, awesome skiing in the wintertime. And the list actually goes on. Um, all of these things are not to be taken for granted. And they, they collectively create a feel uh, that, that uh, the town has built around. And um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of evading the direct answer to that question uh, because I'm not sure there is a direct answer to that. Um, we, uh, we just, I just get a lot of accolades and pats on the back for how well Kimberly is doing but it's a, it's a very intangible thing. You, you talk about how well Kimberly's doing. And I asked you this earlier on, but I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit before I uh, turn to tourism. Yeah. Looking back on it, has it been challenging? Absolutely. It's been challenging. Um, what where advice I... would you, what advice would you give a, fellow mayor or fellow councillor whose community went through the exact, who's going through the exact same thing that Kimberly went through with a major industrial economic driver being shut down. And now looking back at it almost 14 years later going, okay, we, we got through the tough part. We're still not completely out of the woodworks, but we are better than we were in 2012, a year after it shut down. Right. Well, I guess um, I consider myself to be the chief sales officer uh, for the municipality. And uh, I nothing happens without money. I mean, it just it's just it's just a fact. Nothing happens without money. And you either get on your knees to the province or the feds looking for grant money or you go out and attract investment to the community. And as the chief sales officer for the municipality, that's been my job is to get out and find developers that see opportunity uh, in this town and invest money in the town. Once that momentum starts to build, the population starts to grow. And when people are starting to move into the community, especially young families, it creates a really different feel. And uh, one of the things that uh, honestly I'm most proud of is, is our bookends. Uh, we have um, 2000 people, about 23 or 24% of our population is 65 years and over. Uh, it's a fairly healthy number, uh, certainly higher than the provincial and the Canadian average by a fair number of percentage points. Um, and at the other end, the other bookend, our schools are full. We've got a couple of elementary schools, a middle school and a high school. And I think it amounts to about 12 or 1400 students in town. The schools are full. We have young families that are moving to Kimberley. So uh, that, that tells me that we've got a pretty good balance uh, and what we're doing here is pretty attractive to a, a, a broad, uh, you know, base of folks. And um, uh, I am definitely very proud of that. I'm cautious of time here. And I want to talk about my favorite subject because I will be coming to Kimberly the weekend of March 17th. So I'm looking for something to do while in Kimberly. So mayor, what are the what? hidden gems? You've already talked about the hiking trails. You've talked about the Alpine skiing, but what are the hidden gems in your community that you say, if you want to get off the beaten path and come to Kimberly, this is what you need to do. Chris, it's winter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the winter time. 
So, which is limiting in some respects. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, as as homage to our heritage as a mining town, we've got the Kimberley Underground uh, Mining Railroad. It's an interpretive center uh, that is probably either the or certainly one of the go-to amenities that we have. But it doesn't open until June. Uh, so, uh, I'll be back in too, June as well. Then, <laughs> yeah, that's too bad. Um, I guess um, uh, you know we are we are really focused on both not just alpine skiing but also Nordic skiing. Uh, we have some of the best lit Nordic trails uh, anywhere. Can I ask uh, you a weird question? Because I read this on the internet. Because you know everything on the internet's true. But are you considered uh, the Bavarian capital of British Columbia? Um, that <laughs> would be another part of our heritage. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, so very briefly, back in the 1970s, um, there was a highway diversion. The main highway, 95, came through Kimberley and then on to Cranbrook. And in the 70s, they built a diversion around Kimberley, directly into Cranbrook from, you know, from the uh, north northern part of uh, the East Kootenays. And to uh, make sure that we still had people coming here, uh, Kimberley had to create an attraction or a reason for people to come. So they developed this Bavarian theme and uh, Kimberley for more than 30 years was known as the Bavarian city of the Rockies. Um, all of the stores downtown, the facades were all Bavarian style. Um, you know, during the summertime, we there was accordion players uh, that were hired to play in the Plaza. Uh, in fact, the Plaza itself, which is kind of our downtown retail area, is a promenade. And uh, it, in and of itself, is quite an attraction. Hard to believe that that was built in 1970 because a lot of communities today are starting to say, we need a promenade. We need, you know, to open up pedestrian traffic in the downtown area. Well, we've been doing that for the last, you know, 40 or 50 years. So uh, so the Plaza itself is, is an attraction. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think you're going to have to stay focused on some of the snow stuff. I will try and learn how to ski between now and when I come out in March. <laughs> so before I let you go, we started talking about you. We are talk ending by talking about the city of Kimberley. And I've got to ask the million question, million dollar question that every mayor counselor knows how to answer, but it's always great to hear it from their mouth and put it on the record. In your opinion, what makes Kimberley such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Um, the, uh, the uniqueness, uh, comes out of the people that live here. It, it's about our residents. Um, we've got lots of new people coming to town, but we have this, this history, uh, the mining history where we still have fourth generation mining families that live here in town. Um, it truly was a company town for, uh, uh, well, the mine was here for a hundred years. So we've got four generations, the fourth generation still living here. And that mix of kind of the old with the new has created a, a just a very interesting and a very positive, you know, vibe around town. And uh, I think, I think without a doubt, it's the, the people that live here. Mayor Don, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. Uh, thank you so much for stepping up and serving. I don't think municipal leaders hear it enough. And I think you guys are the most important level of government. And I truly appreciate you serving and you taking time to do this interview. So thank you so much for being part of the show. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I've enjoyed it uh, very much. Thank you so much, Your Worship, for joining us today. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch program that you have come to enjoy. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.